at the age of five, or just a little over five, I went to uh, kindergarten and flunked out because I couldn't figure out the blocks with letters on them. When I was a, a, a small person sort of starting in school, I was convinced that I was a fool. They didn't know what dyslexia was in the 50s, or they didn't know it, where it, what it was in the school system that I was part of. I first realized uh, I had an issue, and it was different when I was eight years old. The teacher in, in the class said to me, Jerry, I want you to come up and read out loud. I said, oh, to myself, this is big trouble. I was kicked out of at least two schools and held back once, twice. And I was uh, in a, at a table in the corner of the classroom with two other kids, uh, one of whom was probably autistic, thinking back. And the other was a juvenile delinquent, who I thought was pretty cool. I could work as hard as I possibly could on learning those spelling words, and you know, Thursday would roll around, and again, it would be red check marks all the way down the page. We had the teachers back. So when I hear President Obama or someone saying, we have your back, that it means a different thing to me. <laughs> that was the most objective way I had of understanding intelligence. We were the excluded, and that feeling stays with you. In the fifth grade, and we all have stories like this, the um, fifth grade teacher and the headmistress of the Hamlin School informed my mom that I would be lucky to one day hold a job as a cashier at a fast food restaurant. Every paper that I wrote, I got a D or an F on. I could objectively tell that, you know, everybody else could rock through their multiplication tables, and I could do my ones and my twos and my zeros and my tens. And that was about it. Every test I took, either I got a D or an F on. And I finally uh, graduated from high school with a D minus, minus, minus. <laughs> And the teacher said to me, this means that you have failed, but I never want to see you again. <laughs> so I applied to 10 schools, and I got rejected from 10 schools. Pretty good. Then I went to college. I, uh, I went to the University of Montana. Um, at that time, you could get in if you had a high school diploma. And I entered 1964, and I flunked out in 1965. I failed economics three times in college. I also failed accounting. One time I failed accounting with a D and I actually couldn't get it off my transcript for a little while because I didn't drop the class fast enough. Disorganization anybody? Uh, in 1973 I had flunked out of college five times and seven times in five years and and I was 27 years old. I was married. I was a truck driver and as far as my father was concerned that was the end of my life. I was he wasn't even going to hire me to work in his gravel plant. For the first part of my life, when I didn't know I was dyslexic until I was 58 and my son was diagnosed with it in second grade and I realized that every symptom he had, I had. Um, all that time not knowing um, what it was, I felt dumb. I went and asked about it and they told me that I was dyslexic. It's time to flip the coin and look at the positive side. When I was eight years old, I actually found my first dinosaur bone that year. And that was a pretty big occasion for me. From the very moment that uh, we began seeing students in our clinic, we were struck by the creative talents and cognitive strengths of dyslexic students. But my release, my way of getting some sanity, some bit of peace, was to go out and play in nature. As a neurologist interested in cognitive learning differences, I was impressed both by the creative drive and also the out-of-the-box thinking that these students had. My way of recording information about what I saw was to start to draw pictures of everything that I observed. Dyslexic processing has typically been viewed as if its essence were difficulty uh, with reading and spelling. When I was 12 years old, I built a, an exhibit in our, in our library. And 
and it's still there. While the talents of dyslexic individuals, when they've been taken, uh, taken account of at all, have been assumed to be something that's sort of incidental to uh, the wiring that makes individuals dyslexic. This ability to turn things inside out and see them from shifting perspectives is probably something that allows me to write the poetry I write. Now, it may not be surprising that that was initially the case, since people first noticed that there was a difference in wiring in dyslexic individuals as a result of the fact that they all shared this challenge with reading and spelling. I've been fortunate enough to have a, a, a tremendous rise in my career, and I could give most of that credit to hard work. But I'd also say that that hard work is only fueled by my dyslexic wiring, which for me is a gift. But this deficit-centered view doesn't make any sense. I'm lucky, I believe, because I have this advantage. And I look at it as an advantage. Because it's incompatible with what we've learned about the strengths that also accompany dyslexic processing. And I was the first person to find a dinosaur embryo, a little skeleton of a dinosaur inside the egg. Now, here's our dyslexic question. <laughs> dinosaur eggs were found in the 1800s. First dinosaur embryo was found in 1983. What advantage did I have over everyone else in the world for all those years? I had a hammer. <laughs> That's all there was. Why do we still, with this information that's been accumulating about the link between dyslexic processing and ability? I see, for whatever reason, and I know it's dyslexia, but I see the big picture immediately. I see it all. Why do we still assume that at its heart, dyslexia is a disorder? But some of my favorite moments in my job are when I get the, the call from someone that says, I need to pick your brain, or I have a problem and I need your help. And in about four minutes, they can deliver the problem. I can piece the, the pieces together, figure out where the dots are connecting, either highlight where they've missed something, or we can talk through how to get past a challenge, and then we've solved a problem. Shouldn't we instead conclude that dyslexic processing is really a potentially beneficial way of wiring the brain and that the payoff will come from learning how to identify, nurture, and use dyslexia associated strengths? People had convinced one another that they shouldn't break eggs open because eggs are precious. And so no one ever broke an egg open. When we look at the way that dyslexic brains are wired and perform, it's increasingly clear that we're not dealing with brains that are simply trying but failing to work like everyone else's. And the ways that I find that I think about things, if I can make something make sense for me, it's really easy then to translate that into something that makes sense for the rest of the non-dyslexic world. So just to give you an example of that, I wrote this field guide about the Sierra Nevada mountains. And I love looking at field guides. I never read them. I just look at all the pictures. So this, I know you can't see this in the back of the room, but it's old pictures. It's lots and lots of pictures. It's 2,700 watercolor drawings of the birds and animals that are romping around in the Sierra Nevada. And it's organized kind of like a map of my dyslexic brain. It's not dichotomous keys, you know, go to BB, right? And you go to BB and it says, you know, and it's, 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 it's follow the pictures. And so if you're hiking along and you see a wildflower, uh, pick a color. Yellow. A yellow wildflower with how many petals? Five. Five petaled yellow flower. I would go, ooh, look at the picture of the flower on the cover. And I'm going to bend it back, go to the yellow tabs. Now I'm going to go to the number five up in the corner. And yep, there they are. Here are the five petaled yellow flowers. <laughs> right? <laughs> this is how a dyslexic organizes a field guide. I, I didn't organize the mammals by color, there'd just be one big brown section. Instead, dyslexic processing reflects a very different pattern of brain structure and function, whose essence is to create strengths and abilities rather than simply challenges. Seriously, no one had ever found a dinosaur embryo. So I've gone back now, now that people saw that I could break them open and glue is cheap, you can just glue them back together. <laughs> 
And it turns out that this sort of dyslexic map of how to organize the field guide works for the rest of, of the world. So I think that we have real gifts uh, in the way that we perceive that there's a, there's a lot to share with everybody else. And it's not just for us. I recently c completed, I mean, as of last Wednesday, a book-length poem, um, a long poem uh, um, that I've been working on for in, in different aspects and different times, 30-some years of my life. And um, it deals with the welfare system and the Holocaust. And I um, thought, well, I'm going to have to remember back to experiences I had in, when I, in the 60s. And I had no trouble at all in doing that. I was able to not only, I was able to juggle 15 different stories to 15 different narratives. The form the abilities take varies. I published my first book that year and, of course, sent it to my English teacher. <laughs> but they relate primarily to skill in seeing large-scale patterns, to spotting relationships, or to recombining information in new and interesting ways. Today I manage multi-million dollar budgets, billion dollar clients, and I do that because I have been able to find people that can provide me information I need to quickly make decisions. I can't look at the spreadsheet and tell you what you need to hear, but you can tell me what's on that spreadsheet and I'll piece together the dots and the information and give it back to the team for information. The dinosaur embryos that caught people's imagination and caught, caught I don't know, caught something. As the University of Montana, the very people that had thrown me out of college seven times gave me an honorary doctorate. <laughs> These are the skills that lie at the heart of creativity and innovation. I spend most of my time uh, in our business of thinking, what's next? Where are we going? Where do the stores, what do they have to look like? Where should they be? How big can we be? And I, and I spend a lot of time doing that, and, and it works. And I see it. I see it in my mind, and then I start working towards it. And then two weeks later, I got a MacArthur Fellowship. Today, McDonald's is my third largest client. So then they made me a professor. <laughs> Just because I had a hammer. <laughs> the dyslexic community is like a lion that's been kept in a cage, supposedly for its own protection. But you don't defend a lion. You just turn it loose. Last night, I was sitting at the table with this incredible community. And um, in our discussion there, uh, something that occurred to me is that I will never again refer to myself as a severe dyslexic. From this day forward, or last night, I am now an exquisite dyslexic. dyslexic. <laughs>